my name is Abby Rappaport. I'm the publisher of Stranger's Guide. We're an award-winning publication that commissions stories from local writers and photographers around the world to build authentic portraits of places from Scandinavia and Tehran to Colombia and Lagos. Learn more about what we do at strangersguide.com. Today I'm excited to introduce our great panel. Ben McKenzie is an actor, writer, and director who's now writing about cryptocurrency. He holds a BA in economics excuse me, and foreign affairs from the University of Virginia. He's working with Jacob Silverman on a book about crypto and fraud. Jacob Silverman is a journalist in New York writing about technology and national security for the New Republic with occasional freelance adventures elsewhere. He is also the author of Terms of Service, Social Media, and his work has appeared in the New York Times, Slate, the Los Angeles Times, Book Forum, The Washington Post, Politico, and many other publications. Ed Onguizo is a New York City-based reporter covering labor and technology for Motherboard, Vice's, Vice News's technology section. Most of his work has focused on app-based gig labor platforms, antitrust, anti-monopoly law, labor movements, capital markets, and surveillance technology. Please join me in welcoming Ben McKenzie to the stage. It's a fucking crazy space. Nobody wants to work anymore. Yeah. Everybody's lazy, so it's yeah. like, here's this new like gold rush, and everybody's just going in. And yeah. because everybody's going in, it works. You know, yeah. it's like when everybody pulls out, like somebody's gonna be fucking standing there, you know, like without a fucking chair. But yeah, I don't know. Here's the best part. I could be 100 percent wrong. I'm just ready to talk to everybody who's listening and watching in 2037, and we'll see what's up. <clears throat> I have hundreds of opinions, thousands of opinions hundreds, thousands, but the only opinion that I really think is worth uttering in public is Bitcoin is good. What you want to do is you want to find everybody with money and you want them to buy Bitcoin. Be connect! Wow. Lately, everyone's been talking about NFTs or non-fungible tokens, uh, which are popular uh, form of crypto art. Uh, but NFTs can be pretty confusing and there's a lot of misinformation out there, so I wanted to clear some things up. Can you explain what an NFT is? Um, well, a non-fungible token. Non-fungible. Yes, okay. which is basically a digital contract that's on the blockchain, so you can sell anything from art to music to experiences, physical objects. Like what could I... I'm not going to jump into the NFT world, but I bought an ape. I got an ape too, because I saw you on the show with people and you said you got a moon pay, so I went and I copied you and did the same thing. This is my ape. Yours. Yours is so cool. I love the red heart sunglasses. I love the captain hat. It reminded me of me a little bit. This That's is your mine. ape. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. This That's is your mine. <laughs> 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 if we all work at it, and within the next decade, the metaverse will reach a billion people, host hundreds of billions of dollars of digital commerce, and support jobs for millions of creators and developers. There is your home space. Your home is your personal space from which you can teleport to anywhere you want. Avatars will be as common as profile pictures today, but instead of a static image, they're going to be living 3D representations of you. Less than 30 seconds into it, um, I was suddenly surrounded by three male avatars with male voices who were kind of saying sexual innuendos to me. Your avatar looks great. They were groping my avatar. We found one infringement of the rules. And by that, we mean grooming, child sexual grooming. We mean extreme hatred every seven minutes. Honestly speaking, I'd be very nervous as a parent about having Mark Zuckerberg's algorithms babysit my kids. Gary V, it's like <laughs> fucking 11 p.m. Just out of nowhere, just calls me and he's like, yo, I got like 30 people to call hop down. It'll be the best decision of your life. Just get in, that's yeah. it, okay. Collectible watches are smart. Uh, collectible fucking sneakers are smart, but Thundercats are not. Who the fuck do you think you are? Every heavy hitter you can imagine exactly. who's worth a billion dollars was on this one call, and Gary V is in the little corner, the little square. <laughs> he's, he's going, crypto punks. It's gonna be huge. It's gonna be the next Facebook. Hey, Gary's just like, everyone shut the fuck up. Here's what you're gonna do, and you're gonna do it right now. You're all gonna buy a bunch of crypto punks. He's like, who here owns one? And like one guy raised his hand and it's because Gary bullied him into buying it the day before. <laughs> and he's like, just buy it. I, and I, was, I was just so pulled by his like conviction. <laughs> I bought like eight of them and um, they, they did pretty good. Can I ask you guys a question? When, when Gary does that call, 
with all these billionaires and uh, eight months or a year later, everybody's like, Gary was right again. <laughs> yeah. Is it possible that he's right because of the call? Isn't it good we can do this together? Hello. Good afternoon, Austin. Good afternoon, South by Southwest. Um, first of all, I just want to say thanks to uh, Vic Berger and Ben Craw for that amazing video. Um, my therapist asked me this week to describe my nightmares in vivid detail. They nailed it. Um, the sign on the door says, uh, this is, trust me, I'm famous, Ben McKenzie questions crypto. So allegedly I'm in the right place, but just to address the elephant in the room, what am I doing here? I'm, I'm writing a book about cryptocurrency and fraud, what? Well, my name is Ben McKenzie, and uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a semi-famous Hollywood celebrity. Um, if you know me, it's, it's probably from my work on television as an actor, um, probably, uh, uh, that cop from that TV show, or uh, that cop from that other TV show, or uh, Ryan Atwood from the OC. Thank you, thank you. Forever, I will be Ryan Atwood from the OC. Uh, in my role as an actor, I'm, I'm just a performer, really, right? I'm a, I'm a jester here to entertain the court. Um, so what do I know about cryptocurrency? And why am I so into it that I'm actually writing a book about it? Well, this might sound strange, but what if I told you that the very fact that I am an actor might give me a unique perspective on cryptocurrency and how the industry actually operates. Easy Money, the book that I'm writing with journalist and author Jacob Silverman, is about two things primarily, money and lying. Now, I know a little bit about the former for my degree in economics, but that's uh, UVA 2001, wahoo wah, anyone, anyone UVA, okay. Um, I know a little bit about the former, the money, from the econ degree, but it's the latter, the lying and the intersection with the former that really fascinates me. Maybe that's why I do it for a living, the lying. In fact, I've already lied to you. It's in the title of this program. Does anyone know what it is? My name's not Ben McKenzie. It's Ben McKenzie Schenken. I was uh, born here, uh, local boy, uh, St. David's, just up the road. Woo! That's right. Uh, I played football at Austin High. I uh, yeah. Uh, played against Drew Brees. He kicked my butt. Uh, studied economics at the University of Virginia. Did some acting, and now I'm writing a book on crypto and fraud. So you're all cut off now. But recently, I've spent a lot of time endeavoring to understand how the crypto industry works or doesn't in three specific ways: the economics. Uh, i.e. the incentive structures in play, the markets and their functioning or lack thereof, and the marketing of the cryptocurrencies. You know, my degree in econ is very helpful for the first two. 20 years in showbiz has been very helpful for the last one. So to be clear, I'm not focusing on the technology per se because that's not where my interest and my expertise lies. Uh, for help there, I rely on the experts. Uh, professors of computer science that Jacob and I have interviewed, as well as folks in programming, software, systems administration, things like that. For the, for the tech today, I'll be relying on Jacob and Ed, uh, both accomplished journalists who cover tech at the New Republic and Motherboard, respectively. So let's talk about money and lying real quick, and then we'll get to the panel. Money is pretty self-explanatory. You ask most people about money, you know, what is it? And they kind of look at you like you're stupid. And then they kind of mumble. And then they kind of say something like, well, you know, you use it to buy stuff. And that's right. That's, that's one of the core functions of money is a medium of exchange. What's weird about cryptocurrencies is that they're not actually used to buy things, not directly. I mean, back in the day, uh, prior to 2011, they, they were used to buy drugs. Uh, then the Silk Road got shut down. Um, but now they're basically traded amongst each other. Um, so if you don't really use them to buy things, then they're not really money. The thing they call money isn't really money. That's interesting. In poker, you might call that a tell. So what are cryptocurrencies if they're not actually currencies? Well, what do they do? People put money into them 
and they expect to make money off of them. Under law, that's an investment contract. That's a security. Securities have been regulated in the United States since the 30s, because prior to them being regulated, a lot of bad stuff happened. Um, and they're supposed to be regulated now, yet cryptos have been flourishing in an environment where regulation has been, let's just say, lacking. And even worse, most of the trading volume in the crypto cryptocurrency markets actually comes from the overseas exchanges, which are often run through shell corporations in the Caribbean. So unlicensed and unregistered securities are being traded largely on unregistered and unlicensed exchanges through shell corporations in the Caribbean? That seems kind of sketchy. I thought cryptocurrency was the future of money. I thought crypto was supposed to offer us a democratized, decentralized utopia where the unbanked would be banked. Surely, for the average American investor, crypto can't just be reduced to gambling on unregistered securities through apps on your phone, can it? Well, that's where the second part of our book comes in, the lying. Joining me on our panel first, he's a staff writer from The New Republic and the author of Terms of Service, Social Media, and the Price of Constant Connection. He's also agreed quite foolishly to, to write a book with me about crypto and fraud. Please welcome journalist and author Jacob Silverman. Thank you, buddy. Here, you know what? Actually, let's move over. And, uh, and next, here, why don't, you, why don't you take that one? And next, um, yeah, we're making it up on the fly. And next, he's a brilliant reporter at Motherboard and one of the sharpest minds around when it comes to analyzing the societal impacts of emerging technologies and labor issues. He's also, and, and not to set a low bar for him, but he's, uh, he's a lot cooler than Jacob or me, uh, Edward Ongweso Jr. All right, gentlemen, we've got about 30 minutes to talk about crypto and fraud and crypto in general, which doesn't give us nearly enough time. Uh, and then we get do a little Q&A. Um, I figured we'd maybe start the conversation or be guided by this, this, this card that I've got here about uh, incentives, markets, marketing. Um, starting with incentives, one of the things that's interesting to me is Crypto and Bitcoin often talks about how there is no marketing department for Bitcoin, right? And yet to me, because it doesn't really offer any positive societal value that I can, that I can see, it's basically used to trade uh, back and forth, so that's speculation, right? That's sort of akin to gambling. Then there's illicit uses. Um, it doesn't really have a lot of positive values, so it's all marketing, the whole thing to me is marketing. I'm just interested in the incentive structure of people inside of it who are definitely about marketing it and trying to sort of promote it. It sort of leads to a lack of criticism from anywhere because most people aren't motivated to criticize it because they're not in on it. Mm -hmm. um, do you have thoughts on that, Ed? I mean, you've been, you've been working in this, you've been covering the field for a very long time. Um, I mean, given how, yeah. how young the, the crypto industry is. Have you noticed that in journalism, that, that like there's, there, are, there are some very good journalists who do cover crypto who are, work for crypto uh, publications, but there's also a lot of hype. Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think, um, I think a, there's a lot of self-referential, self you know, discussions that go on, right, where right. a lot of the advocates, a lot of the loudest proponents speak in a language where they're talking about what will emerge eventually. Mm -hmm. Uh, why they believe that, you know, given enough time, given enough investment, given enough support, this or that feature might emerge. Yeah. But, it, you know, it, it's similar to like, you know, the overlap with discussions about Web3 or discussions about the metaverse where the thing in the future is supposed to be what we're working towards right now and that in of itself is enough to justify all the flaws, shortcomings that you're supposed right. to overlook right now. Yeah, you know, we don't actually have um, a way, you know, a, a use case, a useful, you know, use for crypto right mm -hmm. now, but we will, you know, if you give it enough time, even though the, the main one, you know, like you said, shut down like about a decade ago, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are ones like, you know, if you want to speculate, if you want to launder money, if you want to, you know, if you want to do a cross-border payment system, like those are use cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what if mo most of the things that people are advocating for at this point are 
figuring out you know ways after the fact to justify why a lot of speculation is going on right now right moving assets around or justifying you know otherwise meaningless assets with crypto back to it and saying that this will be the you know, building block of a future economy mm -hmm. that will empower and liberate people and not that this is like a building block for financiers and speculators to get as much money as they can out of something before it gets regulated right Right. We talk a lot about that, that crypto hasn't really been regulated. It's fallen into, because it's marketed as, uh, a, current, as a cryptocurrency, as some new thing, it has sort of, it's been able to kind of exist free of like sort of clear guidance from regulators, right? There's a lot of sort of like, they'll slap somebody down for, you know, BlockFi for its lending program or, mm -hmm. or you know, Tether gets, uh, has to settle with the New York AG. Uh, that's a stable coin. But there's, there's just sort of a lack of guidance. J Jacob, you and I are writing a lot about that sort of thing, but do you, what are, what are your thoughts on that? What do you, what do you sort of see that? Uh, how did that emerge, do you think? Well, I think there are a couple of factors. One, you had some crackdowns on the ICOs during the 2017, right. 2018. ICOs vote. are initial coin offerings. Right. right, when there are a lot of fraudulent coins presented um, basically as un, unregistered securities, and a lot of them were, were straight up fraudulent, and some people paid fines, like notably DJ Khaled or right. Floyd Mayweather, yeah. uh, whom you know, who's May now being sued again. Mayweather's being sued again yes. for, an for another dubious coin offer. Which was Ethereum Max, which we wrote an article on Slate about, Kim yeah. Kardashian and Floyd Mather being, being but, sued by them. But I think there was definitely a lack of whole of government strategy. I mean, that's w yeah. one thing that, it can be a little wonkish, but that's one thing we're looking for now from the Biden administration. They seem to be doing that with the executive order this week. They established a crypto unit in the FBI, a crypto unit in the DOJ. Right. Um, you know, there are things that can be done uh, in Congress, maybe, if they can manage to pass any laws. <laughs> but there are a lot of regulations already on the books, as you know, that yeah. could be applied here. And so you have the crypto companies saying, we need guidance, we need guidance, which is a little disingenuous, I think, because they've already seen some regulatory precedents within the last few weeks with sure. BlockFi and some of these other companies. So, right. I mean, the SEC, though, does need to take a firm line, I think, and say, these are securities, and we're going to yeah. regulate them accordingly, instead of doing it sort of piecemeal, picking some of the worst offenders. Yeah, you know, so when I fell into the cryptocurrency uh, rabbit hole, I took Gary Gensler's, uh, Gary Gensler had the SEC's course on crypto, um, uh, which was taught at MIT in 2019, I believe. It's available for free online. I recommend anyone who has 24 hours to kill to, uh, to check it out. Um, and Gary, you know, comes from uh, uh, Goldman and is, you know, uh, understands finance well. And he talks about that a lot. I've, I've never met him. I don't know him. But, but I thought he was a, a, a good voice in terms of trying to understand some of the risks. But it does seem to me, just speculation, of course, that he seems to be getting increasingly frustrated that there isn't lack of guidance, uh, that there isn't, the, there, there's, an inability to enforce the securities laws or perhaps a lack of political will yeah. from the establishment. And so, you know, it's somewhat of a free for all. And he talks about it as the Wild West. And he talks euphemistically about a spill in aisle three <laughs> as the uh, possible crash of the cryptocurrency markets. I think it might be a little more dramatic than a spill in aisle three, but I guess we'll find out. Um, it does seem sort of, Ed, like, like there's a lot of this happening right now. I, now I'm maybe broadening outside of crypto, but just a general sense that, look, if you were to compare th asset values and sort of you know, take, take whatever metric you want, PE ratios or whatever, it, we would be in a bubble right now, right? Everything is inflated and there's understandable reasons why. The pandemic created the need for a lot of sort of economic measures that would keep us from crashing. But I see in times of bubble, historically, there, are, there is a lot of fraud. There's a lot of people who are kind of gaming the system, right? There's a lot of easy money out there floating around. Are you seeing that in other sectors as well as crypto? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one, one reason that there's a lot of focus on crypto like, is over the past few years, there's been a you know, huge explosion in the value of some of the assets. And, and the size of the schemes mm -hmm. uh, that have been going on. But I think across the board, there's you know, a sort of bubble, asset bubble or speculative bubble that's building. 
Uh, I mean, I think if you look, for example, in tech more generally over like the past two, three years, right, there's a little bit of a focus on, you know, firms like SoftBank who are just throwing around right. tens of billions of dollars at companies and inflating the valuations um, of businesses that had no workable business model, right? right. You know, Uber, WeWork, Katera, um, companies that the, the goal was to monopolize. And so you can use the money to just inflate it, you know, try to you know, get as many users or consumers as possible. Right. Um, and then after you become the market, uh, you know, try to charge a monopoly price, right? Right. But I think that, you know, that bubble, that tendency to, to have, you know, valuations that don't really match reality is, you know, spreading mm -hmm. in general or permeates or a thing. Or was but, spreading. Yeah, or was spreading. Right? <laughs> Until recently. But it's, um, I mean, in crypto, even like with the recent sell-off that happened after the, after the peak in November, yeah. I mean, you're still seeing attempts to rev up the market again, right? So you have, Always. you know, attempts to you know, bring back NFTs or with, uh, with some crypto companies looking at NFT marketplaces. Yep. You have some of the major ones like OpenSea or Looks Rare, like being implicated in insider trading. Um, right. You have some uh, like attempts to, you know, leverage existing, you know, platforms or, or build out new games yeah, yeah. where, you know, NFTs are central to them. But I think in general, right, this, this is something that goes up because there's a lot of money in there. There's a lot of money that's involved, potentially trillions of dollars. Yep. Uh, it's easy pickings for a lot of them. Yeah, and that, that, that segues perfectly into our, our, our look at the markets. You know, the markets are, are at this point, basically unregulated, the, the crypto markets. You know, so when you look at them, you see a lot of things that would not pass muster in regulated markets. There's an enormous amount of wash trading um, there was a study, academic paper written, um, that looked at some 20-something exchanges and found, I think, 70 to 80% of the trading was wash trading. So wash trading is when you, uh, you, know, you, you basically sell, buy and sell something back and forth amongst yourself to inflate the value. You haven't really spent any of the money. It doesn't actually, it's not actually worth that. You then dump it onto somebody else and you're inflating the value uh, that way. And, it's really hard to kind of look at things like wash trading, insider trading, a lot of the stuff. I'm not saying that doesn't happen in regulated markets. Of course, no markets are perfect. Markets are created by human beings and human beings have greedy tendencies and things happen. But, um, but it does seem to be just sort of extraordinary, like how much inflation. I mean, I was talking to a uh, CEO of a, of a crypto company and I was asking him how much actual fiat is in the system actual you know real money because uh, he was giving me the the market cap of crypto overall which was like 1.8 uh, trillion and he told me eventually he said 10 percent he said 10 15 percent that's not a lot of real money compared to what it's supposedly worth mm -hmm. at some point it feels like a bubble absolutely i i just wonder what the the, the i see this I wonder maybe we should talk a little bit about the similarities historically to the dot-com bubble, to penny stock trading in the 80s. Um, we've talked to people at the SEC or used to, used to be at the SEC who talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, you know, lessons we can draw from that, I guess? Well, I think there are historical parallels that you have to pick and choose a little bit, so some of these elements. but. Right. Like, there's certainly aspects of penny stocks or sort of boiler room type activities or uh, pre-depression unregulated markets. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that people don't realize a lot with these markets, besides the kind of extraterritorial ungoverned nature of most of them because they're based in Malta or in, in the Caribbean, um, is one, the wash trading, which is such a huge flaw in these markets. Yeah. But also, um, you just can't really trust any of the numbers that you're getting. A lot, the actual governance of these markets is very opaque. Mm -hmm. We've talked to people who, and these stories are, you know, predate anything we've learned, but you, know, you can talk to people who, who did ICOs in the last few years, and one, you have to pay to list your coin on, on a, an exchange. This is almost universal in the industry. You pay to list your coin on the exchange, and then at some point you're asked to help with market making, as it's called, which is essentially formalized wash trading to keep the volume of your coin up. If your coin's volume falls below a certain level, you get delisted. Um, so there are all kinds of sort That's of- That's shocking. 
There, I think people don't realize that because they assume sort of, oh, free market, which must mean somehow reaches a certain equilibrium of fairness. But right. no, what it really means is it's free to be manipulated. Yes. And also these companies, the New York Stock Exchange has sort of delineated duties. Right. And it's not trading on its own exchange, for yes. example. Binance is trading on its own exchange. All of these companies are occupying all these different roles of basically unlicensed banks, unlicensed exchanges, yep. trading on their own exchanges. They're make, their own broker dealer, they're, everything. they're trading on, They're yeah. clearing houses, all these roles that would be by law yeah. uh, potentially separated yeah. in, a regu in a more regulated market. Again, we can talk about all the imperfections of mainstream American financial markets, but it, it's- We don't have that much time. Yeah, but uh, it's just, uh, it's rather shocking when you realize that it, it's sort of anything goes. Yeah, it's really wild. I mean, there's that joke that uh, crypto is uh, speed running the last half a millennia of, uh, of financial mistakes, but they are, I mean, it's all of this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's like wash trading, insider trading, manipulated markets, massive conflicts of interest. Um, it's really, all right, so let's try to find some good stuff. <laughs> let's work on it. That isn't illegal stuff. Um, I have heard about remittances that, um, uh, my sister-in-law does some work in Afghanistan, not physically in Afghanistan, but helping uh, people get out of Afghanistan, and that some, some folks are using crypto to sort of like, again, you always have to get it into fiat to do stuff with it, but like given crypto to like change into fiat to get stuff that they need. Um, and so good, right? I mean, great. Um, obviously, that's only, if that's true, it's, it's a very small percentage of the population, because Afghanistan is obviously a desperately poor country, very limited internet access, I would assume limited you know, knowledge of how to do this stuff with crypto. Um, but it is something. The thing is, it's only really happening because the state has failed, right? And the United States obviously <laughs> bears a lot of mm -hmm. responsibility there. But it, so like if there were nothing else, maybe you could use it for something. But the remittances thing is, Oh, it, if you widen out even a, just a little bit more, seems to be somewhat flawed in and of itself just because it, it's not being used broadly for that, right? Like El Salvador legalized it, and El Salvador is heavily reliant on remittances. Oh. Um, you know, some massive number of, El, of Salvadorans live in the United States. I think it's like two million or something is the estimate of a country of six. Mm -hmm. And so they're sending a lot, but they're not even, they're not even using it. Mostly dollars. Yeah. They're using dollars because there's things like Western Union and stuff that, I mean, people complain about it, but like it, it works, right? They charge you a fee. Um, have you, I mean, you, you deal with a lot of like, you, you're very aware of those sorts of issues in your reporting. Uh, I, I, am I correct in like understanding that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are areas where, you know, crypto and various technologies or, you know, applications or services that are private plug a hole. Right. or can plug a hole that's emerged because the state or other institutions have failed, right? Um, remittances, you know, it could be an example, figuring out a way for people to quickly transfer money if they're unbanked, you know, these are like, in theory, good test cases. But I think the question that you always want to ask is like, what kind of world are you building and how do you want to get there? Do we want, you know, incidentally, I think usually people are getting empowered or are benefiting from uh, crypto being used as a, you know, peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, payment system, mm -hmm. or as a place for them to sell their artwork if they can't get it sold in some other traditional place, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the consequence is that you're encouraging, you know, in people's social imaginations that solutions should be privatized through the marketplace, right. um, and that we should, you know, commodify and subject everything to market logic. And I don't really think that's the solution in a lot of these cases, right? Mm -hmm. If we want, for example, you know, artists to be you know, better paid and taken care for, we should spend energy in developing public options for you know, artists or creative you know, you know, people to, to be able to make a living and sustain themselves, yeah. as opposed to subjecting them to the market or subjecting to them to a hyper-financialized market that's being developed by a bunch of venture capitalists and financiers who are mainly interested in ensuring that they can squeeze out the last few billions from this thing before the SEC comes to town, right? Right. It, or DOJ. You know, you know like we, should, yeah. we shouldn't be supporting enclosure because a few people are making a lot of money yeah. off of it. We should be 
pursuing alternatives. And I understand that you know, a good chunk of it comes from the fact that you know, the state has failed in some places, bureaucracies can be cumbersome, but all of this is you know, kind of done or pushed, not mindlessly, because that I think removes some of the agency and the real desire by, by some people to find some alternative that works for them. Um, but a lot of the people who are doing the loudest pushing, you know, the greatest amount of pushing are people who have the most to gain from this, right? right. It's you know, A16Z, you know, Andreessen Horowitz, they don't really care about art and you know, <laughs> the nature of culture, cultural production. You know, right. I mean, they might like write good blog posts about it, but they don't really give a right. fuck. Well, they're know? venture capitalists, it's yeah. even the word. They're capitalists and yeah, it's exactly. not, you know, they're, they're, they're making but, money. They're, they're but that's where the problem is they're presented as something else. Yeah. And that's almost where we get to the And that's where we get to the marketing, right. So the marketing is my pet peeve because, you know, <laughs> I'm in showbiz and I know the tricks. Um, one of the things that's, that's very um, clear to me is, you know, one, the main thing you're trying to do with marketing, one of the, the main things you're trying to do is take something that's boring, which is like tokens being traded on an exchange on an app, like it's just numbers going up and down, and you want to elicit an emotional response. You want to get people to care about it and to focus on it. And so that's what you see, you know, the Matt Damon ad, or what are you a wimp? You gotta you gotta gamble on some unregistered unlicensed securities on your phone. Um, the Larry David ad is sort of making fun of like like kind of like using the humor route. Um, but it's it's frustrating to me because so so I, I went to the Super Bowl, which was blessedly inside the actual stadium free of crypto, but the ads obviously were everywhere. And it's hard for me not to see the the this is sort of a natural end point. Because if crypto were something like a multi-level marketing scheme or a Ponzi scheme or a decentralized Ponzi, you would need ever more people in the door. You need more and more people to buy it and buy it and buy it. You need more fiat. More fiat, money, mm -hmm. real money. So it ends up with the Super Bowl and, celeb and, and, and you know, movie stars, and athletes hawking this stuff, trying to just get that extra few bucks. Mm -hmm. It's really wild. I, I don't know what, people ask me a lot about, well, what do you think about the celebrities? Like, do they, do they, does Larry David love cryptocurrency? I doubt it. I mean, I, I, I don't know that he thinks about it much. Maybe he does, I'd be happy to talk to him about it, or Matt, or anybody, but, for the most part, it's pretty straightforward, right? Like some, some crypto company has a bunch of money. By the way, where did they get the money from, right? I mean, if you own an exchange, where'd the money come from? Can you figure it out? Um, and, and so they got this money and they need to make more of it to keep the whole thing going. So they reach out to the agencies and they you know, have a list and they, they, they pay them a lot of money for not a ton of work. Um, it's not that complicated. And yet I think it's very effective. I mean, it must be somewhat effective or they wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, we wrote our first article about Ethereum Max, which is a very obscure coin that um, Kim Kardashian, amongst others, uh, promoted. And now they're being sued in California. She's, she and the others, I think, are being sued in California court about it. But this is just, in the six months that we've been working together, it's just blown up. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you what do you make of that? I, I I'm just befuddled. I'm just sort of like it makes sense. Yeah. But it's terrifying to me. It is, I think, because as we've talked about, if a celebrity is shilling a product, you know, shilling being our favorite word in this industry, but yeah. you know, it, whether it's shoes or a sweater, or even a car or a vacation or insurance, those are you understand the terms of what you're getting, and also when you buy the the item or service, you're probably not going to lose money. Right. As a result. Or not all of it anyway. Or at least not all of it. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously one big difference. But you know, you're inviting people to take on risk that they don't necessarily fully understand through no fault of their own because there's no disclosure in this industry. Right. You know, if we were to continue to have crypto ads on TV, it might be nice to have some pharmaceutical type disclosures at the end. You know, Side effects may include having to take out a loan from your parents, something like that. Um, you had to do that joke right when I swallowed water. Like yeah, that. sorry. But um, you know, one thing we've also talked about is celebrities are kind of the end point of this. They're, they're the megaphone. They, they have some ethical 
and due diligence responsibilities, which maybe they've fallen down on, but they're a tool being used by moneyed right. interests to try it because they're sympathetic and have fans. And so the, the fault doesn't necessarily lie purely with a celebrity, but it also shows a certain desperation of the industry right. to get more money in the door. Again, everyone's always trying to get back to fiat because that's how we spend money and that's what? what we generally No, we spend. hate fiat. Oh, right. Fiat was terrible. Oh, we're all losing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. But the other thing is, um, you know, if you look at a lot of the volume numbers of retail trading as everyday traders, it's largely down since last May. Yeah. So I, we see sort of the intensification of the marketing and of the celebrity campaign, of the buying of sports sponsorships and all yeah. this stuff. Uh, as perhaps a sign of industry desperation because they really need more money in the door. And also the lending, you know, they, they're now, you, the lending rates are astronomical, yeah. you know, which is very odd to say the least, right? Yeah. People yeah. are like, you can lend your, give somebody your crypto and then they like give you AP, APY on it of like 20%. Yeah, maybe. things far beyond anything yeah. traditional finance. And, and the last thing I'd say is, you know, it is important, as, as Ben's been referring to, to think about where the money comes from and where it's going. Yeah. Um, you don't need to be highly conspiratorial. Take Crypto.com, the, the company that sponsors Matt Damon, renamed Staples Center, doing ads with LeBron. Right. Google the CEO. There's a good Daily Beast article about his history. Yep. His last company in Southeast Asia collapsed under pretty suspicious circumstances. A lot of these people who are in this industry don't have the most... Well, they have colorful histories, we'll put it that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that information is out there, but you know, to someone watching on TV and thinking, maybe I should gamble 500 bucks because I could really use a, a payday to try to pay some bills or I'm underwater. Yeah. We get it, but once you start peering under the hood here, the warning signs appear pretty quickly, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know which, which way I was going to go with that. But um, it, 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 is, it is interesting that it's at its sort of seemingly at its peak or near its peak. I guess the peak would have been November um, in terms of the actual price of, say, Bitcoin, the market cap of the whole thing, I think. But, but the, the, the buzziness seems to be slowing down, actually, somewhat. I mean, it, it seems to be related. And I think there's a fairly, you know, my, my, my sort of pet theories, it's fairly straightforward when there's so much easy money in the system, people take all kinds of risks because money's not free, but it's cheap. And so there's a lot of risk-taking behavior that's happening. But as the, the um, markets start to inevitably eventually go back, then the, risk, the riskiest assets get pulled back the fastest, right? And you see it in the regulated markets, but you're also seeing it in the crypto markets as people are sort of like, I don't know if they're panicking yet, but like they are trying to get out. Um, I guess I want to take it into a slightly, take a slightly different um, direction, um, and then we'll get to the Q and A's. Um, the 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 there's a lot of talk of like how once you put your money into cryptocurrencies, oh. it's very tricky to get them out sometimes. We hear a lot of stories about this, right? Not just getting hacked and like your money's gone or your cryptocurrency's gone, but like a lot of stories of people who just like all of a sudden there's roadblocks to getting it out. All of a sudden they're being asked for like bank statements from three months and you know all this K retroactive KYC AML kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's odd to me that that's happening. I mean, odd is, I guess, a charitable term. <laughs> um, I, I just wonder what you, do you, do, have you followed that much? It's, it's, it's all over the internet. It's like people who put their money on there and then they're like having a hard time getting it out. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of that comes with, you know, the fact that these or, you know, maybe decentralized networks, but they're on centralized systems or interfacing with centralized systems at the end right. of the day right. and traditional finance ones. Um, and sometimes it's going to be a little difficult to get like the, I mean, the, frankly, like the magic internet money out, you know, right. but I, but I think also, you know, this kind of hits on another issue, which is that, you know, when it comes to the way that these systems work, a lot of them, the financialized, especially the more esoteric financialized ones, mm. are like kind of fantastical and wouldn't be allowed to happen uh, in real, like with other assets or securities and you'd probably never be allowed to touch securities again. You know, like right now if I wanted, if we wanted to, right? Like 
and we had Ethereum, you know, I could loan you some. Right. And then I get you to like make a currency which is connected to that loan and, you know, maybe pays out a percentage of the, the collateralizes like and collects all of the debt and the loans that I might have to you or to other people, right? right? And then that coin's value is like pegged to some stable asset right now. And then I can make like some group that's based on that and we offer like a cut of the, of the you know, growth in, in the token speculative value. I mean, all of that is just, Let's you do know, it. Sounds yeah. Great. Okay. Good. We can make Everyone some money in this off room. That. We can all. We can. We'll form a DAO. We We're all going to be rich if we did that. Yeah. With um, you know, traditional finance. But right. I think you know, for for some, maybe the benefit is like, okay, you get to you get to experiment and do all sorts of decentralized or financialized activities that you might not otherwise be allowed to do. Yeah. But um, should you? Right. I feel yeah. like each time that you know, crypto that you know, crypto backed assets, right, are developed and pushed further and further. A lot of it is done just for the sake of doing it or for pushing out some new way of generating greater returns than before and not actually thinking about the risk that this is introducing into the ecosystem, mm -hmm. not thinking about the ways in which people are going to lose their shirt and not really be able to be made whole again, but that yeah. the people who are offering these new, you know, uh, features are, you're fine, right? right? It's not really, like, like we'd be fucked, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, someone else who has the money to gamble um, wouldn't be. And a lot of these people are the ones who are the, who are the loudest and pushing mm -hmm. yeah. the new types of, you know, gambling yeah. exercises to be yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's a great point. All right, uh, so let's, uh, let's get some questions. Um, uh, this is from Turner Wright. Uh, when you walk around South By and you see all these comparing, companies offering NFTs, free tokens, and other crypto-related products, what are your thoughts? Well, I've got a few. Uh, we, uh, we actually went out, um, was it last night? Or was it the night before? I guess it was both. Uh, well, no, I went out last night. You guys went out two nights ago uh, as well. Um, and there are, you know, there's obviously a lot of, a lot of this going on at South By. And yeah, uh, there was an NFT thing. I won't say the, the company we were at, but there was an NFT thing. And it was like, well, you got to scan the QR code, and then that takes you to a wallet, that you have an account with the company that you got to sign up for. And then you, I guess you would get an NFT. I, I balked. At you the can't view the NFT, though. You can't view it until you do it. And so, you know, in terms of marketing, what that is is, you know, you're just getting them in the casino. You're just, you know, you're bringing them in. Um, now, you, you, you may get a thing. You may get a JPEG on a blockchain that you can look at. But, uh, sorry, so mean. Uh, but... But uh, it was some truly, I mean, look, I, I, for, so look, I'm an artist. I support artists. I, digital art can be great, but I don't understand why it needs to be on a blockchain. I don't really quite understand that. Um, and so my thoughts when they're doing it is I just recognize the marketing, right? I mean, that's, yeah. what, I, that's what I'm struck by. Is there anything you guys were, you guys were at some of these parties, like... I'm just, to be honest, I'm kind of surprised at how bad all of it is. How bad it is? Yeah. You mean the yeah. art or the... the, the the salesmanship or all of it? the hype, the art, you know, sometimes uh, uh, there's billions of dollars, maybe trillions, potentially. And um, I don't know, we went to some pretty whack events. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, that, you know, I, I don't know. I think I would have just expected more interesting gimmicks, demonstrations, attempts to show like a real use or value or something yeah. fascinating and interesting about yeah. it. But instead, a lot of it is like really centered on a very narrow experience that will like maybe woo you, um, mm -hmm. but not much in like yeah. thinking about how this could actually do anything other than make money for you, maybe if you're lucky. Right, yeah. Which is, uh, I don't know, I just, I just expected a little bit better yeah. PR. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see it as marketing and as sort of a, I mean, a lot of people describe blockchain as sort of a technology in search of a use case, and we are not necessarily technical experts. We have some understanding of the underpinnings, and frankly, whenever we've interviewed a software engineer or computer scientist who's not financially linked to the crypto industry, 100% of the time they have told us this technology doesn't scale, has fundamental problems, and immutable ledger is not necessarily what you want for these kinds of systems. Right. The only, uh, maybe I'm skipping ahead to one of the other questions, yeah. but the only sort of use case we hear about sometimes proposed that seems somewhat reasonable is sort of to reform back-end banking systems, some of which are written on COBOL from the 70s and things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the plumbing, really. Yeah. Um, but what you have is sort of this mystification and salesmanship of the technology. 
blockchain is something yeah, and amazing. So, and, yeah, yeah. And but, sorry, we, yeah. We, we skipped over it, and I don't want to cut you off, but just oh, so sure, for sure. people that are not. So blockchain is, is 30 years old. It's not new. It's been around since at least 1991. Um, uh, Stuart Habern's got W. Stornetta at Bell Labs, I believe. Um, and, and Bitcoin combined, uh, roughly speaking, uh, blockchain with public key encryption uh, to form this currency that isn't a currency. Um, but the, the uh, underpinnings, the, 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 the blockchain itself is just a distributed ledger. Mm -hmm. It's just a way of record, of keeping records. So the, the problem is that it doesn't really, the scalability is really hard. It mm -hmm. doesn't really work very well because it's very energy intensive mm -hmm. under a proof of work system. So mm -hmm. sorry, I didn't mean to cut you oh, off. Sure. But like that's what, that's what we're seeing from people that really know their stuff is unless they have skin in the game, unless they're sort of their livelihoods or their investments are, are about it, they're quite dismissive of it, I would say. Yeah, I, I would say I've been reporting on tech for 10 plus years and uh, I wrote a, a book about social media and you know, 10 years ago, there were some people critical of Facebook, uh, um, but there are also plenty of people in the tech industry who were glad to take money from Google, Facebook, and other companies that, look, actually provide services, but you know, have some, some problems. Facebook is obviously a very controversial company right now, but I've never seen, at least in the last decade, a sort of technological innovation that's as divisive within tech. Yeah. People are really at odds. Game, p gamers, people at gaming companies don't like it. Uh, Salesforce employees were striking over the, the possibility of introducing NFTs. And I think that speaks to perhaps the insufficiency of the technology and the over salesmanship of the technology. Right. And, w and one sort of last example to close it out is that, for example, there's a lot of talk now lately about CBDCs, central bank backed digital currencies, and sort of a way to get money easily from the government to the average citizen. Those probably don't need the blockchain. They don't. And most people don't think so. But there's an attempt to sort of conflate the two. Yes. And so once you start talking about digital money and what digital money should do, or and something like a CBDC, you realize, like, actually, maybe the blockchain isn't necessary entirely. Right, right, right. There do seem to be some potential uses for it, um, like you said, in sort of the plumbing, um, you know, smaller systems. Um, but, but, but there's a lot of problems with it. There's, mm -hmm. It really doesn't, it's not just the scalability, but someone, someone just asked a question about, um, where did it go? But it, it was related to the environmental aspect. And I do think we want to talk about that. We need to, we need to sort of mention that because that does get glossed over a lot. Um, you know, I find that, that arg the argument that like, it's, you know, somehow it's not as bad as it appears to be, because it does appear to be bad. You can go on, is it Digiconomist that's the? That's uh, one, and then there's uh, Cambridge University has a site that also tracks right. electricity. And, it, and the electrical usage for mining the Bitcoin is something like, it's a medium-sized country. It's, it's the equivalent of a, the energy usage of a medium-sized country. That's a lot of energy for something that in economics is a zero-sum game, so making it a negative-sum game. That's crazy to me. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, we're, we're going to go visit a crypto mine on Monday because there's a big one outside of Texas. But, I mean, outside of Austin. Um, but, like, I don't understand. I understand why those companies exist because they're making money on it. But it is a little terrifying that it's, I mean, it crashed the electrical grid in Kazakhstan or contributed to that. It's you know kicked out of China supposedly kind of maybe oh, sort of right oh, some oh. parts <laughs> with the wink with, with the, the wink, wink yeah. right I mean it's it's causing a lot of problems just the electrical usage itself it's a it's it's controversial in upstate New York mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. where we're based where we're all based um, I don't know do you, do you do you have thoughts on the electrical it's just extraordinary to me yeah I mean the environmental one is also a bit divisive because there's arguments about how you know, the second, you know, second largest cryptocurrency, Ethereum, um, yeah. blockchain is supposed to switch over to a method which is supposed to be more environmental friendly. But they've been saying that for how many years now? A while. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a years. I mean, years. It, it's supposed to be this year. Let me, let me right. ask you a question. Do you think you'll, they'll, Ethereum will switch over to proof of stake before Tether gets an audit or after Tether gets an audit? <laughs> Sorry, that's an inside crypto trick. <laughs> Maybe uh, at the same time. Okay. But, um... But I think also there's, there are other concerning elements. The things that you pointed on are think also things that people should hone in on. You know, the disruption of energy grids in states and countries. Yeah. The revival of coal, you know, power plants. Or, right. uh, or using, you know, various energy sources to power the mines. I think that, 
you know, even if we are you know, generous and say, okay, maybe the environmental impact can be mitigated. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an incentive in there, as we keep seeing every time, to look for the uh, cheapest possible energy sources. It doesn't really matter if they are fossil fuels or not. Right. Right. And and, and figuring out ways to like actually, you know, stop that. If if it's going to continue to exist, stop that from happening. Yeah. Right. Because I do feel on some level that it has been normalized or there's talk or desire to like integrate it deep enough where it's here to stay, right? right. Unfortunately. You know. uh, <laughs> um, but also at the same time, if, if that's the case, then how do you avoid, you know, you know private equity firms like Atlas, Power, uh, Atlas Holdings mm. going in and reviving fossil fuel factories right. so that they can mine crypto, yeah. a little bit of crypto before, you know, um, before they can't anymore. Yeah. I don't know. And I think that's also like, you know, one of the things that we've talked about before is like if you can't come up with, if, if there are problems that keep emerging because of inherent incentives to just search for the cheapest possible energy source, if there are issues that keep coming up that put it in conflict with the community, then like why does it actually exist, right? right? Does it exist to help you and facilitate the future of, of culture and, you know, econ or finance or, you know, right. community, you know, community driven action right. or is it you know to make some vc rich mm -hmm. yeah exactly um, can i add one thing to that? yeah please please i mean i i think ed is spot on and one thing that i think also speaks to the nature of of crypto which is the and one thing that frustrates all of us i believe is that there really is very little underlying value i mean if this stuff crashes it could all go to zero because there aren't really companies producing goods that you know, prop, like that prop up a stock or something like that. Right, there's and, not a revenue, it doesn't, yeah. it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't provide a good or a and service. So this is where you get into the negative sum game, which is that you're using all this electricity, you're chewing through computer equipment like crazy. You're, you're a gamer or something. Yeah, I'm yeah. very upset about the video card shortage. This is personal <laughs> to me. Um, so they're chewing through computer equipment that could be put to other uses, even if it is people playing Call of Duty, which right. arguably, arguably is more productive than mining Bitcoin. <laughs> and, um, oh, that's a real but problem. it really just emphasizes this sort of superfluousness of a lot of this stuff and how you're actually wasting resources. Like, I would like to see capital be productive. You know, the A16Z is investing billions of dollars in crypto companies. Right. Why, why, what purpose does that serve besides enriching A16Z? Right. If you want to be productive with your investment capital, how about investing in companies that actually make things that are at least of consumer interest or could pre perhaps could contribute to the common good? Right, right, right. Um, uh, Darius, uh, I'm just not sure how to pronounce your last name, that's a good question. Uh, the question is, isn't a lot of the graft, false starts, environmental inefficiencies, and lack of clear use cases just a part of the emergence of a new technology? I think that's a great question. Um, Bitcoin and crypto is generally often compared to, to dot-com uh, era, right? It's, the internet actually changed a lot of stuff, and yet a lot of those companies, the vast majority of the companies that came through there, failed, and failed sort of spectacularly. Uh, Pets.com, I'm looking at you. Um, but, and, 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 and yes, there was, there was the, the, the micro cap, um, you know, there's a lot of fraud in, in that areas as well. So there, yes, there is some um, parallels, there are some parallels to be drawn there. However, the thing that I struggle with is that the internet really did change everything, right? The session's being streamed um, and produced a lot of value. The ability for us to communicate, the ability for us to, you know, engage in commerce, you know, my, my house is, is a big fan of Amazon.com. There's a lot of packages from Amazon just about every week. But I struggle to find that in crypto. I don't know what is the thing, again, because it's not a, doesn't provide a, 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 a good or a service. So what does it do besides being traded? So that's where, that's where the distinction that I, that I would, uh, would draw there. Does that seem fair to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think... There's this question of what are we innovating towards? We're probably not going to have hyper Bitcoinization where Bitcoin become. My apologies to all the anarcho capitalists or Bitcoin maximalists in the room, but yeah. you know we're probably not going to have Bitcoin as a world reserve currency. And there's so many technical impediments and um, you know sort of public education, all these sorts of things that may prevent crypto from really being sort of like a billion user mass market technology. And I don't think that's being recognized, which is why. 
you have all the salesmanship. Right. The other thing I would say is we often hear, oh, it's still early. That's what crypto people like to say, somewhat ironically sometimes when right. there's sort of a setback in the industry. But right. are we? I mean, the, the Bitcoin white paper, I think, was October 2008. I mean, granted, it takes things some time, but I think we would be farther along if, uh, you know, we have other ways to transmit money that are digitally that are pretty convenient. Yeah. Unfortunately, some of them like Venmo and Bitcoin and Cash App now put crypto front and center in the right, app. Right, but right. Um, I don't see where we're advancing towards that actually is any of the things we're being promised, financially liberating, uh, leveling the economic playing field, you know, pr introducing new opportunities for monetization that actually satisfy more than a small subset of users. Yeah. And I would say also this narrative that technology in its early years is just a disruptive force you can't really contain is a narrative that's been constructed to kind of overlook and obscure the way in which technology is developed today, right? Mm -hmm. Technology that is developed privately, you know, driven largely by financiers who are taking some already developed product and figuring out a way to, you know, bring it to market in a specific way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be messy, right? Because they're, you know, usually trying out business models that don't really work, that aren't socially useful and trying to create the markets, you know, that will, you know, figure out a way for it to be adopt, uh, adopted, right? Yeah, when you have, you know, VCs, when you have esoteric billionaires, when you have, you know, private groups of people driving what is being developed, then you're, it's going to be messy, right? right? Because their concerns are not our concerns, right? right? You know, what they're looking for for developing technology is, you know, wildly different from what we would want. And, 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 so, that, and, and that's yeah. where like regulation comes in. Yeah, right? I mean, you know, some level, there have to be some rules. I just, I, laws. like technology doesn't have some inherent nature that it, it's, that Bitcoin is just an example of, right? Right, right. It's, um, it's right now, it's the result of just like, you know, private capital driving the development of it. And so that's going to be the messy process. Not, you know, because it's new, right? Printing right. press didn't radically destroy uh, tech dollar, or, you know, life at the time, as yeah. did like a, a numerous other technological innovations or developments over the years, right? You only really see this with stuff that comes out of a very specific sector right. of society. Right. And you do want risk taking, of course, right? I mean, you want people to, you know, risk taking does spur innovation, which, which you know, can add value. The, the pushback that I have here is like, you know, these externalities, right? Like the cost to human society. Um, to society and to to all sorts of you know there's labor issues and there's environmental concerns and there's all sorts of uh, things that come into play. But um, in terms of crypto, like my main thing is just you know the amount of potential fraud in the system yeah. is just sort of staggering because again they're operating outside of you know the regulation that that has existed for literally a hundred years almost I guess ninety years um, that would normally regulate this stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in that, that sort of tension between those two mm -hmm. things. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, last question. Uh, ben, when will you be writing a screenplay on all this? <laughs> I mean, we'll see, we'll see. Well, I mean, uh, yeah. I'm ready. You're ready? Should we do it? All right, all right. You, you join us? Sure. Why not? Sure, why not? Uh, okay. Let's do it. Um, all right, well, thank you guys very much for joining us here. It's been a real pleasure.